An ambulance rushes to a call in the Sydney suburb of Mossman. An elderly woman has fallen near the entrance of her home unit. But what seems to be a simple accident has a more sinister cause. There was absolute fear on the whole North Shore. You start thinking that you might have a serial killer on your hands. The injuries indicated to us that there was a progression in terms of severity. One of the things we noticed was that there were some shoe prints in blood. So we had something that indicated who this person might possibly be. Police tonight are warning that a deranged killer is on the loose. He's now killed twice and may strike again. The risk was that he would confront the police and say, put up or shut up. Or, who's to say, he wouldn't have gone off and attacked another woman. Hi. Detectives get this gut feeling. I had that gut feeling. And uh, I knew that was our man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Gwen Mitchell Hill was found lying in a pool of blood just steps away from the safety of her front door, her neighbours immediately called for an ambulance. But Gwen's shocking injuries quickly raised suspicion. Something wasn't right. An elderly lady doesn't just trip over the doormat and cause that sort of damage. It just doesn't happen. Ma'am, can you hear me? Her bag was nearby and we asked her friend to check whether she'd been robbed or not and we discovered the purse was missing. When I received the phone call uh, to go down to Mossman, the nature of the job was uncertain. It was an incident involving an old lady. Uh, whether she'd fallen, whether she'd been attacked, we were unsure at the time. Unfortunately for us, there was no crime scene. One of the residents in good faith thought they were doing the right thing and actually hosed away most of the blood and any other evidence that could have been there or might have been there. There was a few blood stains, a bit of um, paper with blood on it, and basically that was about it. We took some blood samples to make sure that they were hers, to make sure that there were another, other blood samples there, if there was an offender. What I was told was that this lady had been found, that her uh, walking stick was close to the body, that uh, she was, had uh, severe head injuries, and that some money had been stolen. The 82-year-old was rushed to hospital, but died soon after. She never regained consciousness to tell the police what really happened. I was concerned. Um, in my view, this was not typical of a fall. Um, it really suggested to me that this could very well be a homicide. What happens with people if they're conscious while falling over backwards, you always, as a natural instinct, turn round as you fall. What was very worrying about this case was that the injury was in the midline. And those injuries, in my view, were caused by a blow or two blows to the back of the head. There was just nothing obvious that had caused these injuries except for a blunt object with some weight behind it imparted with some considerable force. From an investigative point of view, the two options we had was that it was a related killing or a stranger killing. After days of investigation, we were starting to form the view that this was a stranger killing. So we're looking for someone who is not connected or related to the victim, a very difficult task. Police canvassed the area looking for witnesses to the robbery. But despite the time of day and public location, no one saw anything suspicious. The chances of the killer being sighted were very high, were very high. And he was very lucky, very lucky not to be sighted. For two months, investigators struggled to find leads. Then another attack, less than one kilometer from where Gwen Mitchell Hill was murdered. The victim this time was an elderly man. Greg. The victim of this assault had a description of the attacker, 
We decided to release that with the endeavour of trying to locate who it was and the community to help. But just as it was made public, there was more bad news. Police tonight are warning that a deranged killer is on the loose. He's now killed twice and may strike again. Lady Winifreda Ashton played a game of bingo here at her local club yesterday afternoon. She went to her bank. Within half an hour, she was dead. She'd been bashed in the bin room of her block of units and strangled with her pantyhose. Her attacker escaped with a small amount of money. Today, her neighbours were shocked and living in fear. Well, was it Lady Ashton? Yes. The significance of this particular murder was if they were linked, we now had a major problem. When an elderly woman was found bleeding outside a block of units, she died before she could tell anyone what had happened. But her injuries and her missing purse convinced police she was the victim of a vicious robbery. Two months later, Lady Winfreda Ashton the widow of famous painter Sir William Ashton was savagely beaten and strangled after being robbed of just a few dollars. We walked down a driveway and inside the foyer area was a, uh, an area where the bins were stored and inside that room was a deceased person lying on the ground. She had her raincoat, a red raincoat, slightly pulled up over her neck and uh, there were some unusual elements in that her shoes were located a short distance away, so was her walking stick, and at the top of her head were a pair of stockings, there was a gas bill and a purse. Later that night, when we did examine the deceased very closely, we noticed that there was a small piece of stocking embedded into her neck. There was no doubt about it. This was a homicide, and the reason why it was a homicide was that it was a ligature strangulation. And it can only be a homicide, really. This is not the first time the killer has hit this area. Two months ago, another elderly woman was murdered in an almost identical crime. At these flats, just a couple of blocks away from Lady Ashton's unit, Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill was bashed and left to die in her foyer. Again, all for a few dollars. The police say the similarities are chilling. There was evidence to suggest, with quite confidence that these crimes were linked. The environment, uh, the time of day, both ladies were over 80 years of age, both ladies had money taken out of their purse, both ladies were brutally assaulted and only about one kilometre apart. While the first crime scene was cleaned up and all of the evidence washed away, this scene remained intact and undisturbed. Forensic investigators were able to find what they hoped would be their first clue. She was wearing gloves and we found a number of grey hairs. There were two possibilities. One was that she's placed her hands above her head in an effort to ward off the attack and that the exchange of hairs to the gloves is simply from her own head. Or that during the attack she may have grabbed some hairs from the attacker. So we refer them off to the forensic laboratory and they're looking at peculiarities, colour obviously, thickness, those sorts of things. Unfortunately, the hairs in this case, being grey, weren't particularly distinctive. They're fairly similar from person to person. DNA testing was very, very new and you generally needed large quantities of blood or human tissue to actually carry out DNA analyses. What was clear at this second murder site was that if the killer was the one and the same, his aggression towards the victim had intensified. In our first murder, we had a degree of greed in terms of stealing from the purse. What was a little bit different in this one was that the lower half of her body was bare due to the fact that the pantyhose had been removed. And the pantyhose had been used as a weapon. So. In this particular case, we were now thinking that it was not only greed uh, and violence that was motivating the killer, but there was a degree of um, a sexual motivation that could be associated with it. It wasn't the crime of someone who was committing a robbery. It was a crime of someone who had a particular interest in committing extraordinary violence, taking risks, and with some bizarre sexual 
tastes and probably bizarre sexual fantasies. Crimes of this nature are typically committed by people who are young. Now, consistent with that was the extraordinary violence and energy shown, which is that of a younger person. And it seemed male rather than female, because mostly females don't engage in violence of that level. Most people who commit crimes do it at their convenience, which is they do it fairly near home. They feel comfortable in the area. They sort of know the streets. They can look out for where people are. And also, it means they can plan escape routes if they want to. What we're looking at is someone who, round about four o'clock in the afternoon, is available time-wise to commit a crime. And that narrows the field down somewhat. One of the categories was that it could be a student. A student who gets out of school at 3 p.m. and has a desire to steal money. A couple of the high schools we looked at, you know, there was over a thousand students attending. And of course, at that point of time, we didn't know the sex of the uh, killer, although the profile seemed to think that it was a young male. The possibility was it could have been a female. The only suspect detectives had at this point of the investigation, and who might fit the profile, was the young man who had attacked the elderly gentleman. Today, the police released this composite picture of a suspect. He's 22 to 25 years old and about 180 centimetres tall. I feel I've seen him a few times. Because of the hair, it was unusual. I'm a hairdresser and I know just hair. Police want him because just a few weeks ago, he bashed an old man who lives just down the road from Lady Ashton. That's about the only clue the police have got to go on, but they pretty well believe the killer is a local who may well strike again. One of the aspects of uh, a serial killer is that there is an emotional time break between killings. And in this particular case, there was about nine weeks between the two. So there's a cooling off period when someone's operating as a serial killer. Therefore, our decision making process was if we had a serial killer on our hands that had committed two murders, we expected a third. The murders of two elderly women in the Sydney suburb of Mossman had police convinced they were dealing with a serial killer. Then a report came through of another attack. Doris Cox is a resident of the Garrison Retirement Centre off Spit Road in Mossman. On Wednesday at about four in the afternoon, she was walking down one of the narrow pathways inside the grounds when she was attacked. She had severe injuries to her head and to her face. The original thought by the other residents that found her was that she'd fallen over. The crime scene, again, was washed down by um, staff at the retirement village. There were some dilute bloodstains and that was all that was left for further examination. Mrs Cox is now in a satisfactory condition at Mossman District Hospital. Doris. He was someone who perhaps could tell us who the killer was or a description of the killer. But unfortunately, she was a chronic dementia and she had no recollection of the assault or, um, or who committed the crime. And these things happen. I mean, this was one of those days. So we basically uh, picked up the pieces and uh, off we go. A canvas was conducted immediately of the area and we did discover a couple of witnesses that didn't actually see the crime, but what they did see was a person in the vicinity at the time a young male who was riding a skateboard. And uh, where this person was riding the skateboard was down the footpath, only a couple of metres from where the crime occurred. And it was at that time, it was round about four o'clock. So he became a person of interest, a real person of interest. Sydney detectives want to question a young skateboarder over the brutal assault on a woman in Mossman three days ago. The youth was seen in the area at the time of the attack and police believe the sighting could be linked to the murders of two other elderly Mossman women earlier this year. Bearing in mind with the viciousness of these assaults, and we could not determine what was causing the wounds on the skull or on the head of these ladies, it was then thought that well, perhaps the weapon's the skateboard. Unfortunately, the skateboard and its rider disappeared without trace and another lead evaporated. Painstakingly, detectives followed up every piece of information they received from the public, but the killer remained a step ahead. We 
gone from March through to May and now through to October, and we're now in early November. It was a Thursday afternoon and uh, there was a phone call. And the phone call was simply that there's another one at Lane Cove. With a sprightliness that belied her 85 years, Madge Pard met a violent death as she walked home from the Lane Cove shops. It's believed a killer stalked the elderly widow before hitting her repeatedly over the head with a blunt object. She was left dying in the alley behind her block of units. You could have dropped a, a, a pin in the office because of the silence that went round the office. Not another one was the, uh, the comment, not another one. I just can't believe it. As you know, we saw a lot of each other. A friend of Mrs Pard's was among the first on the scene. Well, I thought she'd had a heart attack and rushed to, to the big house to ask Gra Gracie to ring for the emblems. Mrs Pard dropped her two shopping bags the moment the attack began. When she was found, she was still wearing her wedding ring, but three small money purses were missing. There was similarity with the victim, there was similarity with the crime scene, there was a similarity with the method. Same time of day as she'd been shopping, everything was similar to what we had. So we now had three murders and one attempted murder. And just like the similarities in the murders, this crime scene had been cleaned up before the forensic team arrived. There was a lot of frustration because we were potentially losing evidence again. We um, could have found evidence that could have indicated things such as uh, the number of times the person was hit. There might have been some shoe print evidence at that particular scene and uh, being washed down, again, you lose that potential to recover that sort of evidence. A very extensive examination of the crime scene was made and a number of items were located. This included a pipe, some barbells and a fence post, which may have been used as a murder weapon. Even though these injuries were severe, what wasn't present was massive skull fracture. So what that would imply is that, relatively speaking, the object isn't very heavy but would probably rule out concentrated weights like barbell weights. I don't think that these injuries were caused by a fence post. There was really nothing in these injuries to indicate that it was one weapon above any other. With strong similarities to attacks on elderly women in Mossman, police today renewed their manhunt. Teams of detectives spent the day canvassing surrounding streets. Gripped by fear, elderly people on the Lower North Shore now are varying their daily routines. No, well, I'm scared to come up here and get back safe. I don't mind telling you. I am. I wouldn't walk. So we worked that night. In fact, we worked right through the night, right through Thursday night into Friday morning. And I uh, told the team that uh, early Friday afternoon I was going to head home for the weekend and uh, hopefully have a day off and come back fresh. And uh, I actually got within probably two or three hundred metres of my home um, when I got an urgent call that uh, they'd found another body. Good evening and welcome to News World. And sadly, for the second time in 24 hours, the unthinkable has happened. Another old lady has been murdered, battered to death on her own doorstep in broad daylight. Sydney has a monster on the loose who singles out the most defenceless. Now four elderly women are dead and one is still suffering. The latest killing happened here at the Wesley Gardens Retirement Centre at Bell Rose in Sydney's northern suburbs. At first, nursing staff thought the victim had died after a heavy fall. It was quite obvious when we arrived and had a look at this latest victim. She'd been strangled with her own pantyhose and her purse that was near the body had been interfered with and it looked like some money had been stolen. And here again tonight, well-meaning people who never dreamt a murder took place may have accidentally interfered with a crime scene. As happened at Lane Cove last night, the area was washed away before the police arrived. I did ask them what they thought of the stockings that were tied around the neck of the deceased person, and they indicated that they thought perhaps uh, she was trying to keep her neck warm as, as a scarf. We believe there are similarities in relation to the other murders we are investigating on the North Shore. And there was absolute fear. Before they were frightened at Mossman, but it was contained, we believe, or we thought, at Mossman. But now people were frightened on the whole North Shore. Where next? 
Four elderly women, all over the age of 80, were dead. All had been bashed and robbed, all murdered around 4pm. There was no doubt police had a serial killer on their hands, and the time span between his killings had now lessened to 24 hours. When things are proceeding like this, you can be fairly sure that they're going to reach some sort of a climax, which is likely to be uh, more florid crimes, or he decides that he's had enough and makes an admission and calls up the police. The murder of Olive Cleveland sent the media into a frenzy. Newspapers were calling the murderer the granny killer, and the pressure on police to find him was extreme. Police have intensified the manhunt. Additional detectives assigned to the case spilling over into makeshift offices in a garage at Mossman Police Station. We went from a, a group of 15 or 20 investigators investigating a, a, a couple of murders. We then went to a group of 35 investigators and we ended up with a group of 70. Sydney police have stepped up security measures for elderly people with a series of self-protection seminars. The large turnout for the first of the seminars is a strong indication of the fear among the elderly that the killer will strike again. Uh, well, that last lady that was... It was killed? so close to It was very close us, to us. Know? And we are... Well, we're not totally altogether frightened, but, I mean, we are... Uh, well, we'd like some security. What was concerning the task force was that the latest killing had occurred outside the geographical area of the first three. There has to be a link between the murder scenes. And the question that we all asked ourselves was, what is the link? And that's what an investigator's got to look at, and that's what we looked at. One of the characteristics of a serial killer is that they work in an area where they've got control or knowledge or it's a comfort zone. So we believed the killer had some intimate knowledge of the area of Mossman, intimate knowledge of the area of Lane Cove, and intimate knowledge of this retirement village at Belrose. There was a common denominator geographically with these locations. Find the geographical link and you'll find the killer. But less than two weeks later, there was another murder. The granny killer had returned to a street not far from his first victim. A widow who lived alone, Muriel Faulkner, had recently suffered a stroke. Sometime after 4.30 on Thursday afternoon, she became the North Shore killer's fifth victim. Mrs Faulkner was strangled and bashed, her body found in the blood-stained hallway by a visiting neighbour. The injuries here were severe head injuries caused by a blunt object again, as well as strangulation, and then what appeared to be a displaying of the body after death. Um, this was an addition to the previous cases and again indicated to us that there was a progression in terms of severity. It's usual for people who are committing a series of offences to become more confident as time goes on or to do things in a more deliberate fashion because they've had a bit more practice. That's fairly classic among the development of offences of this nature. He had plenty of time with Mrs Falconer because he somehow succeed in getting into the house. Once into the house, it would have been easy to subdue her. And once she was killed, he had plenty of time to arrange the body, uh, do whatever bizarre things pleased him and made him feel good, and then depart. The amazing and outstanding factor about this crime scene was that it was the first pristine crime scene that we had. It was a crime scene inside a dwelling. And one of the things we noticed was that there were some shoe prints in blood. We immediately thought that these could well, in fact, be those of the attacker. But there was a problem. The shoe prints weren't very clear. We uh, subjected the carpet to a number of chemical treatments and light treatments. And we did this in a particular sequence and we found that with a particular treatment, we were able to actually recover a lot more detail that wasn't initially uh, visible to the naked eye. We could see sufficient detail um, to determine this, that this was some sort of business shoe or some sort of uh, perhaps military shoe. Even though a lot of young people have large shoes, 
it was a type of shoe that is worn by not so much a juvenile, but a more mature adult male person. We're now starting to, to move towards it being an older person rather than a younger person. One of the issues that came up was the very neat arrangement of things. I think the stick was put in a particular place and the victim's shoes were arranged in a particular way. And people who are taught neatness and who learn to live a life of neatness uh, have often spent a lot of time in the military. Troops are today pounding the beat on Sydney's North Shore to protect the elderly from the serial killer. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Good afternoon. Now right. believing the granny killer was an older man, investigators decided to re-interview previous witnesses, hoping to prompt fresh memories. I was asked to go and speak to the neighbour of Muriel Falconer down at Mossman. She opened up a little bit more than what she did initially to the police and told me that she had saw a grey-haired man, quite portly, and he looked like a doctor. And on the way back to the office, I said, how perfect would this be? A portly old man with grey hair in his 60s running around committing murders in Mossman and who would suspect him? It was first thought the granny killer was a young man. But now police had a shoe print and a sighting at the last crime scene that suggested someone older. And there were also those indistinguishable grey hairs on the gloves of the second victim. I said, how perfect would this be? A portly old man with grey hair in his 60s running around committing murders in Mossman and who would suspect him? Detective Tuxford now went looking for reports of the grey-haired man at the crime scenes, and the result was chilling. I went back to the Lane Cove area. I did locate a number of people who, in fact, saw a middle-aged man with grey hair. G'day, love. Let me carry one of those for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's the grey-haired man assisted this neighbour of Mrs Payard's to her unit and uh, this neighbour thought what a lovely man this man was to assist her with the groceries. So again a grey-haired man had been placed at the crime scene. But was this man a good Samaritan or indeed the killer? Then a report of an assault a month before the first murder and near to that crime scene gave detectives a lead. She was visiting from Queensland and she had been shopping for the day and was walking home to where she was staying. The assailant bashed her over the head and took her handbag for money. Luckily for the detectives, the victim had taken good notice of her assailant as he walked by. No longer was he just the grey-haired man. Detectives get this gut feeling. I had that gut feeling. And uh, I knew that, that was our man. But they had no name for him. And it was now three months since the last murder. I was on afternoon shift and I got a call to attend the Greenwich Hospital where a woman had said that she'd been assaulted, indecently assaulted, by a man. And I got a description of one man who was known as the Pie Man, who had made a delivery about the time that the elderly woman had said she'd been assaulted. The inquiries I made with the hospital staff gave me the name of the pie company and they gave me the name of the man who had the contract to deliver pies to Greenwich Hospital and his name was John Wayne Glover. The detective contacted Glover and arranged to speak to him the next day. But it was an appointment Glover would never keep. When he hadn't showed up by 6pm, I phoned his home again wondering why he hadn't shown up. His wife answered the phone and explained that right at that moment um, she was leaving for the hospital because he'd just attempted to commit suicide. He'd left a um, suicide note and I, I remember very much um, the words no more grannies on it. 
It was a significant thing for me to do as a junior detective, to go in and talk to him by myself and get a photograph, knowing that if I didn't get it, all was lost. This was a tremendous breakthrough for the task force because we now had, not only did we have the sketch drawing of, of the 50-year-old male grey-haired suspect who had committed a lot of assaults, we now had a Polaroid photograph of another suspect who had come to light just recently. Our feeling was that we were on the way. We were on the way. As John Glover was placed under surveillance, his background was being checked. And not surprisingly, apart from his age, it matched the forensic profile perfectly, starting with a criminal record in his 20s. Uh, there was one there where there was some assault on a woman. There was one there of uh, offensive peep and pry. He had, in fact, had some period of time in the army in another country. We found out that he was a company representative and he had a company car. We found out that he normally worked of a morning and he was normally finished by three o'clock in the afternoon. So he has the availability of time. The other thing we learned about him was that he was linked to the crime scenes by employment. As a pie salesman, John Glover's job took him to Belrose, Lane Cove, and back to his home in Mossman. It doesn't prima facie mean that he's the killer at that point of time, but it certainly, it certainly gives us that sense of uh, encouragement and direction. The pieces of the puzzle were falling together, but the detectives needed more before they could make an arrest. What we wanted was evidence. And what we were going to do was allow him to select a victim, if he did. We would then obtain evidence of him stalking the victim, of being a predator and we would allow him to get within probably metres of a victim, and then we would prevent the crime. There were times when he would stop his vehicle and get out of the car and go for a walk, and that became something of interest as to what he was up to, but then he wouldn't do anything. He'd just simply get back in his car and off he'd go again. But the detectives didn't give up on Glover or the investigation. They were now targeting nursing homes and unreported sexual assaults, wondering if Glover, the pie salesman, might have dropped by. The secretary was actually looking quite knowledgeable and she said, um, well, yeah, we're talking about four and 20 pies. And as soon as she said that, I felt really quite good about it because yes, it was four and 20 pies that this man was, rep John Glover was representing. And she then said, would you be looking for John Glover? I thought, oh, this is just amazing. Like, she, not only does she know about, she actually knows his name, so that's a really positive identification. I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, we are looking at someone called John Glover. And then she just looked me square in the eye and said, that's my husband. And I was just, I was just incredulous. I said, will you tell John that I'm here today? She said, oh, no, I won't, I won't, because he was so upset last time he tried to commit suicide. And I said, oh, OK, that's fine. We all knew straight away the impact that this was going to have on our investigation. The risk was that he would speak to his solicitor and confront the police and say, put up or shut up. Or he would go undercover. Or him being such a uh, wild character, who's to say he wouldn't have gone off and attacked another woman? John Wayne Glover was the prime suspect for the murder of five women. He was under his fifth week of surveillance when a detective visited a local nursing home. I went into my spiel, which was along the lines that I'm making a number of inquiries in relation to sexual assaults on the northern suburbs. And uh, I was wondering if um, they'd had anyone approach them uh, that was offering to sell meat pies to distribute through their kitchens. Without realising, the woman she was speaking to was Glover's wife. It's probably one in a million chance that this would happen, but it happened. And you have to deal with it. I mean, it's one of those things, you can't run away from it, you have to deal with it. The following Monday morning, surveillance are still carrying out their normal surveillance duties that have been going on for several weeks. 
And John Glover actually leaves home at the normal time. He gets into the company car and he heads off. He rung his employer and said, I'm not coming into work today, I'm going to see my solicitor. So we thought, that's it, game's up. He went to a bottle shop and bought a bottle of whiskey, which we all thought was very odd, but still. He had a case with him, and we thought, well, that's to go and see his solicitor with. He went to an address at Mossman, parked his car out the front, got out of the car, had his briefcase, walked inside the premises, knocked on the front door, the door was opened, he was welcomed, he went inside. The surveillance police were sitting down the road, they, they saw this, they were quite happy that it seemed to be a legitimate visit. But the hours ticked by and John Glover didn't come out. By late afternoon, the police were beginning to worry. Fortunately, there was a dog that was barking quite loud near the premises. And so we decided to send uh, the local uh, uniform patrol in to check out this complaint about this dog barking. They went to the premises and um, they knocked on the front door and there was no answer. And the place seemed to be in darkness. So they became quite concerned and so they reported that back and said, well, there's something amiss in the premises. Task force detectives rushed to the scene. What they found inside, no one was prepared for. And inside the premises, they found the body of a 60-year-old female lying in the hallway. It was a, certainly a low point in uh, our career and something we still think about often. I recall seeing uh, the bloodstained hammer on the lounge room floor, on the carpeted floor, uh, surrounded by what appeared to be blood. The situation they faced then was, um, where was this John Glover? I recall in the bedroom seeing a pair of men's trousers draped over the end of the bed. We then got to the bathroom and I saw the feet of John Glover sticking out of the bath. His mouth was barely above the waterline. He appeared to be unconscious and breathing very heavily. We saw a bottle of scotch empty with a paper bag, a number of vials of drugs empty on the vanity, as well as uh, pill bottles. Good evening. Tonight, a possible breakthrough in the year-long investigation into Sydney's granny killings. Detectives this afternoon charged a 58-year-old man with the murder of an elderly woman at Mossman. In the bathroom, police found a 58-year-old man unconscious, immersed in a tub of water. He was revived by ambulance paramedics and taken to the Royal North Shore Hospital. Police now knew they had the killer of six elderly women, but they needed to prove it. We knew we had a job ahead of us, although there was a feeling of satisfaction that this man was in custody. We lacked forensic evidence that could connect him to any of the other crimes. The following morning, a search was conducted of Glover's car and home. Amongst the belongings, a pair of shoes, the soles of which were compatible to the print found on the carpet of his fifth victim's house. But they needed a confession. We certainly hoped that uh, Glover would talk to us. And that following morning, he was sitting up in bed. And I recall speaking to him just in a general sense uh, about non-issues, his family and, and so forth. And then at one point, he came out with, uh, you probably noticed the photographs in the paper of the women. They all bear a striking resemblance to my mother-in-law, Essie. And that was significant to us because uh, she featured in his suicide note from uh, January. At that point, we believed that this man was taking responsibility, albeit in a brief way, for the murders of these elderly women on the North Shore. Uh, he also spoke in this conversation of using a hammer he had at home, of taking that hammer with him and leaving the car, placing the hammer down the front of his trousers and then using the hammer to attack women from behind. After these murders, he would take that hammer home and use hydrochloric acid, which he kept in the backyard of his premises to clean all traces of blood and other evidence from it. He was at pains during the course of his interviews to uh, say that there was no sexual component 
uh, to uh, any of these murders, where Glover used pantyhose to strangle these women. He said he did so in order to make sure that they were dead. What amazed us all during the course of those interviews was the way in which Glover described committing these crimes. They were in such a matter-of-fact, uh, everyday way uh, that he spoke about these brutal slayings uh, that it was extraordinary. It was like he was uh, talking about making breakfast. In fact, during the course of each of the interviews, Glover clearly articulated that he would go to the club and uh, drink beer with the money he'd just robbed from the victims. After leaving hospital, Glover showed police where he disposed of the belongings of some of his victims. Like his killing field, the spot was not too far from his home. Two Sydney psychiatrists have given evidence in the Supreme Court, diagnosing so-called granny killer John Glover as mentally ill. The defence is arguing that Glover is not guilty on six charges of murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility. In an interview, the 58-year-old salesman had explained, it's as if John Glover the good guy was watching John Glover the bad guy. I felt powerless to stop it. I asked him how he explained it. He said, well, the, the bad John Glover would come out uh, and do the act, and then the good John Glover would uh, then take over, which was very easily dealt with by saying, well, at what point did the good John Glover come out? Was it before you washed the hammer or afterwards, you see? It was so, it was so very clumsy. The jury rejected Glover's insanity plea. They found him guilty on all charges. Justice James Woods described Glover as a dangerous man who, if released back into the community, would almost certainly gratify his desire to kill. Glover was given the maximum sentence for each offence. His file was marked, never to be released. John Glover knew exactly what he was doing, that he intended to do what he did. He was cunning in how he did it. And I think that uh, I would put him in the category of simply being bad, not mad. John Wayne Glover had attempted to kill himself while on the outside and again behind bars. 15 years after he was found guilty, he was finally successful. Sydney serial killer John Wayne Glover has died in prison. The man known as the Granny Killer was found dead today in a shower block at Lithgow Jail. He'd hanged himself. 72-year-old Glover was jailed in 1991 for the murders of six elderly women on the North Shore. No family members attended Glover's funeral. He was buried as he lived, with his demons and secrets. There are other crimes in, in, in Australia that have similarities to the crimes committed by John Glover. I still believe that there are certain aspects of his life and aspects of other crimes that may have been committed that one may never know about.